Thanks for watching the Meridian Friends Church sermons here on YouTube. You can also listen to a podcast version of the sermons on either Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts if you ever need to listen on the go. For more information about our church, you can head over to www.meridianfriends.org or check us out on Facebook by searching Meridian Friends. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy the sermon. Good morning, church family. It is so good to be together with you and to be celebrating today and worshiping. And music team, I love that you picked Easter songs. That was an Easter song. Did you recognize that? It's so appropriate, I just have to say. We just sang about the fact that our hope is living. Think about it. Jesus Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. I'm not confused on which holiday it is. But the advent of Jesus, the arrival of Christmas, is the celebration that ends with this sure hope that we have, that Christ conquers the grave, and he is alive today. We're not here today to commemorate a, a historical event of some kind. We're here to worship Jesus Christ, who's living and present and victorious even over death. I love these songs. Thank you. And uh, Lynn over there in the fellowship hall, thank you for your beautiful music. I got to hear Lynn warming up a little bit over there as well. So I don't know what the fellowship hall is saying, but we just sang an Easter song (laughs) announcing the victory that Jesus is risen, and that is our hope. And it's going to derail me for a minute. (laughs) I read something this morning in Luke chapter 12, and it kind of caught me off guard. It made me notice something about Scripture. I hadn't um, previously noticed it was a context of a verse. In verse 4, Jesus said, and this is just for free, okay? So hang on, take a deep breath. If you want to, you can turn to John 8 because we'll get there. But Luke chapter 12, I tell you, friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more just read that this morning and, and listening to this music and this song, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after the body has been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. That's a really commonly referenced scripture to remind us that God is caring for us, isn't it? The very number of hairs on your head are counted. That's amazing to think about. Not one sparrow falls, but God's not aware of that loss. What tremendous confidence we have that in this life, God is watching over us. But the point of that passage, do you realize, isn't about you and I being cared for and comforted in this world. It's about what happens after our death. And that's something I hadn't really thought about or seen before. And it's in the context of Jesus sending out his disciples and giving them warnings and encouragements about the difficulty that they're going to find in this world. As I think about Advent, and if you want to turn to John chapter 8, that's where I'm going to be focused this morning. As we think about Advent, I think that we're reminded to consider Life beyond this life. You know, I wish, I wish that I could give some kind of hopeful guarantee about what is going to happen in the coming months. Have you been following the headlines this week? It's so discouraging. We have new terms for things like smash and grab. You think about this new variant of coronavirus and We look at the headlines, and, you know, we kind of want to come to a sanctuary and and just kind of block it all out, but we don't have to because we have a hope that is greater than all of those headlines. We have a God who is alive, who will watch over us, who already knows about all of these things. I had somebody approach me this morning and say, do you know how many Greek characters there are between Delta and Omicron? There's 11 So what does an Omicron variant mean? I don't know. (laughs) 
But I will tell you this, not one of them is beyond the reach of God's control. He already knows, and I need Advent. I need Christmas. Not, not just because it's wonderful to have family near and to eat too much turkey and, and to celebrate with gifts and Christmas lights and all those things, which I love. And we, we've had a great family Thanksgiving. I hope that your Thanksgiving was as joyful as ours. We had minute-to-win-it games. We had grandparents trying to shake ping-pong balls out of Kleenex boxes that were strapped to their hips and donuts on strings and all kinds of fun things. If you follow social media, you probably saw some of that. Thank you for participating and for planning wonderful games. It's not just because of the fun. It's because Jesus Christ came into this world. He indeed took on a sinner's crown. He traded a, a heavenly throne for a sinner's crown to come and pay the consequence of our sin eternally to give us life. No matter what happens, we have a living hope in Christ. So I don't know about you, but, but I need admin. I need it to remind me of some of these things. We're going to keep lighting these candles as weeks go by, but I need to remember that God alone is my hope. That God alone is my source of, of a kind of peace that can't be rocked. And, and that's the kind of peace that we'll talk about next Sunday. We'll light a third candle on December the 19th, remembering the love that Christ brings to us. And then on December 24th, we will have a special service here for the lighting of the Christ candle. And we certainly welcome you and, and hope that you will come. I just heard somebody tell me that they invited a friend to the Christmas Eve candlelight service. And this is a friend who's like anti-religion, I think is the way it was explained to me. And how nervous she was to introduce her friend to come to our service. And to her surprise, they said, I would like to come. Do you find people are more responsive around this season? Jesus Christ is our living hope. And he can penetrate all of our doubts and all of our barriers and, and all of these things. Advent means arrival. We know that Christ longs to bring these good gifts to us. Are our hearts tuned and ready to receive those gifts? We've asked you, when you think about hope, what is a Bible verse that comes to mind? What is a story? Well, I think of John chapter 8. I think of God's incredible grace that he shows to someone who is brought into Jesus' presence. Many times, as Jesus encounters people face-to-face -face in the Gospels, these are people who choose to seek out Jesus. Some of them even sneak up from behind him and try to steal a healing. And, and, and people just, just come and they beg him, help me, help me, help me, and they're, and they're pursuing Jesus. John 8 describes a very different circumstance. It's the circumstance of someone who was dragged to Jesus. Can any of you identify? I think in former generations with some of the revival meetings, sometimes people were dragged by their heels through the sawdust. You're coming to the altar and we're going to make sure you get there. Maybe as kids or teenagers, you feel like, oh, my parents drug me to church. It's remarkable what happens. And I think what happens with this woman who is dragged up to Jesus I think what happens is remarkable, the grace that Jesus has to show. It's a picture to me of hope. Would you stand with me as you're able? And I'm reading from John chapter 8. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. 
When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. May God help us to shine the light of Jesus in this dark world. Amen? Please be seated. This is so hopeful to me. Which one of us has the authority or the right to pick up the stone and throw it? I'm so thankful for this perspective. I'm so thankful for the grace of God over us. And I have to say this, living in the world that we live in with so much access to so much that's happening in the world, news-wise, I'm so thankful that I'm not the judge. Aren't you? These are painful times. But then again, I think they've always been painful times. Because human nature has been human nature since the garden. I want to frame my thoughts around this hopeful encounter around three words that seem to resonate with this person's condition, this person who is dragged before Jesus. It's an environment of shame, it's an environment of condemnation, and it's an environment of accusation. I want to describe how three ways that Jesus brings hope into our world to overcome this kind of environment. And as you think about those three words for yourself, aren't those fitting of life here on this planet and at this time? There is so much to be ashamed of in terms of what's been done wrong. There is so much condemnation for one another. We are not in short supply of condemnation. And we are not in short supply of accusing each other either. And yet, Jesus broke into the darkness of this world to bring a hope that shines more brightly than that darkness. How does he do that? Well, if we could consider this as a picture of the hope of Jesus, I would say it works like this. Hope, the hope that Jesus brings, replaces shame with respect. Let me offer the context of what's going on here to kind of explain why I choose that word respect as the brightness of Jesus' hope in the face of public shame. Scripture says that Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, when you hear that, you might think rural, serene, tranquil, peaceful. But if you've been there, you know that the Mount of Olives overlooks Jerusalem. It's right there. The big thing that you would see from the Mount of Olives is the temple. Jesus came during a festival. That's why he's there in John chapter 5. The Gospel of John records three times that Jesus traveled to Jerusalem. He introduces it in John 2. He introduces the second trip in John 5. He introduces the third trip in John 10. We know what happens on the John 10 trip to Jerusalem, correct? The other Gospels describe that event as well. Jesus moving on to Jerusalem. It's where he was crucified. Every time that Jesus goes to Jerusalem, he finds persecution. John chapter 8 takes place during his second trip to Jerusalem. He's at the Mount of Olives, yes. And then he goes down to the temple courts. I'm telling you that that's not a very long walk. It's very short. He goes down to the temple courts where where all the people were gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. This is the first thing that you need to know about this environment is that it is very 
public. There is an atmosphere of people who are drawn to Jesus. He's performed miracles. His teaching, it is said, is, is one as someone who teaches with authority. We've never heard a teacher like this. And crowds are starting to surround Jesus. You need to know that. That this isn't just them bringing a person to Jesus with a need. It's them bringing a person to Jesus and choosing a time when it's a very public environment. The other thing you might notice, maybe this jumps off the page to you as you think about these religious leaders dragging this person who is guilty before Jesus. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery, period. They made her stand before the crowd, period. Do you notice something? He didn't bring both of them. <laughs> she didn't commit adultery by herself. <laughs> John goes out of his way to explain to us what's really going on and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses commands that we stone such women. What do you say? They give him one of two options. You're going to stone her or you're going to let her go. They were using this question as a trap. It's a public trap. It's a trap where there's no win. They know that Jesus respects women, which was so ahead of his time. Jesus shows dignity to women. He speaks to women when others would not speak to women the way that he spoke to women in terms of respect. They know that he has a soft spot for women because the women were mistreated in this culture. So, so Jesus is a target for them. They're trying to trap him. If he says, no, no, just let her go, then he's in violation of the law. And of course, if he says stone him, then they're trying to expose him to these people who think that Jesus is compassionate and gracious. It's a trap. They're trying to shame Jesus by shaming this woman. It's interesting how Jesus handles the situation. This is where Jesus demonstrates so much more grace than my natural instinct would show. You know, on the personality scales, I'm a J, which means I'm a natural judger. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? If you, if you didn't know that, it's only because you don't know me very well. <laughs> my first instinct is to ask, what's wrong with you? <laughs> it's, it's to try to figure something out rather than to say, Oh, I'm so sorry that happened. <laughs> the Jesus in me is much more compassionate than the Ken Redford that still lives in me. But by person, hey, man, thank you. She knows me. <laughs> I get it. I get it. In my humanity, I'm a judger. And, and so I just want to fix things. And, and so Jesus, instead of confronting these people who are trying to trap him, Jesus bends down and he starts to write on the ground with his finger. What are you doing that for? Tell them they're wrong. <laughs> now, we don't know what Jesus wrote as he was drawing in the sand as they brought this woman to him and wanted him to condemn her or to release her. They didn't really care. It was just a matter of trapping him either way. And Jesus doesn't answer them. That's grace, isn't it? Sometimes the best answer is no answer. Do you know that? Not Ken Redford, who lives in me. <laughs> he doesn't know that. <laughs> he has to give everybody the answer. He doesn't answer. He bends down and he starts writing in the sand. And some have, some have wondered if what Jesus did is he started writing the sins of each person in the crowd and, and pointing arrows. <laughs> who knows what he was doing? <laughs> who knows what he was doing? But he could have. And that's my point. Jesus responds to this, this public trap, this abusing and using of this person publicly for their ends, he doesn't get in their face. He bends down and, and he starts writing in the ground. Well, they're not smart enough to quit. When they kept on questioning him, then he straightened up and he gave response to them. Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to cast a stone at her. See, what's going on is the Pharisees and the teachers of the law have an agenda 
behind confronting this person for their sin. They're not treating her as a person, right? They're treating her as a means to an end. And Jesus will not have it. And he asks an important question. How about you guys? Are you all innocent? Their agenda is this. It's to win. Are you with me? They have a specific reason for bringing this person's sin out, and they have a specific reason for the way in which they want to bring this person's sin out. And, and this is so like, can I say it? Us as religious people, isn't it? We are so insecure about ourselves that we need to point to someone else's sin to prop up our righteousness. And so they're using this woman. They're bringing her before Jesus in a very public setting to expose her. But they don't really care about that. They're doing it so that they can defeat Jesus, so that they can win. They're envious of his position. They're envious of the miracles that he's doing. They can't stand grace. They want the law. And so they're trying to discredit Jesus. I think this has a lot to say for, uh, to us about being really careful about the way we confront. Wouldn't you agree? Isn't there something in all of us that wants to win an argument? Isn't there something in us that, that has this need to be proven better or right or righteous? That's their purpose. I think a godly purpose for confrontation instead, of course, is to restore someone. We know that from elsewhere in the Scripture. Matthew chapter 18. If a brother sins brother or sister, it it implies relationship. Not just finding a target. If a brother or sister sins, then you ought to go and talk to them about their sin. Is it Christ-like to confront? Well, it's, it, we're commanded to do it. It's not about confrontation being right or wrong. It's about the way we confront and the motive for which we confront someone that can be right or it can be wrong. And Jesus is calling the religious leaders on this one. I want to say, if, if this world, if we as part of this world could learn how to confront yes and confront in love, yes. What a bright light that would be. Amidst all of the shame throwing that goes around. Are you with me? A godly purpose is to restore. In fact, in Matthew 18, it says, go to that person. If they don't listen, bring one, maybe two more that they might listen to. If they don't listen, go further. Don't just drag her into the temple courts in Jerusalem and make a spectacle out of this person. Why? Because it, being personal and private and caring, having a conversation with them, is the best opportunity that person has to be restored. For them to recognize for themselves what's going on. We always try to be the Holy Spirit in somebody else's life, right? <laughs> I mean, I can clearly see what's wrong for you. So I'm going to let you know. And the thing that we are afraid to do is to go one-on-one with the person that we have conflict with and to talk to them heart to heart. But you know that's what Jesus is about to do with her, right? Not in the midst of the crowd. He doesn't even confront the Pharisees in the midst of the crowd, and they're the ones that provided the whole setup to do so. He could have named their sins by name. He could have shamed them in public. He could have fired right back. And this is where I love the gentleness of Jesus, the self-control of Jesus. Why? I'll tell you why. Because he absolutely loves those Pharisees. He loves those teachers of the law. He is going to come back to Jerusalem a third time to die for them. 
He wants to give them every opportunity for restoration and repentance. And so he doesn't waste the opportunity by justifying himself in public. Isn't that just like Jesus and so unlike the world? Isn't that just like Jesus and and so unlike the world that continues to live within the church? That's me and you. Especially us religious leaders who really care about polity and structure and following rules and the law, which are all important things. It's how we do it. It's why we do it. Do we care? Do we love people who don't live up to our standards? Do we care about them? Do we lose sleep over what they're experiencing? They're hurt. Do we care? Or do we just want to prove ourselves right? I think this is the hope that Jesus longs to bring into this world, and he longs to bring it through his church. He lives it. He demonstrates it. He shows us an entirely different way if we would have the courage to follow him in that way. Will Jesus be misunderstood for it? You better believe it. They're going to crucify him on his next round into Jerusalem because of exactly this. He loves people. He loves them too much to use them. He doesn't care about winning. He cares about restoring. Hope replaces shame with respect. And we must keep that in mind. For whatever reason, God respects us, doesn't he? He gives us free choice and free will. He does. He doesn't strip that away from us. He respects us. And we're called to respect others as well. He replaces shame with respect. Secondly, hope replaces condemnation with a cross. We're all familiar with John 3.16, I hope. It is the message of Christmas. It's the message of Advent. It's what Jesus came to bring. God loved us so much, the Father, that he sent Jesus, his Son, into this world. And whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. To me, personally, I I think that's a great verse. But I think we should always remember it with verse 17 as well, because I think it's equally as important. And there's so much more around John 3.16 than this. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. You get it? But to save the world through him. Can you just take a deep breath with me and celebrate what Christmas really means? It means you're not condemned, you who are in Christ. Isn't that a deep breath thing to think about? I I can't answer all of the circumstantial things that are going on in the world and everything else, but, but I think Advent is a time to refocus our hearts around this eternal reality that goes beyond what happens here and now, even to the point of death. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. I, I think God knew that there was enough people who thought that that was their agenda. <laughs> it wasn't God's agenda. But to save the world through Him. Here's what that looks like in our context. Again, He stooped down and He wrote on the ground at this, those who heard Him began to get up one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. There's some interesting commentary around the older ones first. Have you ever noticed that detail? They were the ones to get up and leave first without Jesus saying a word. They've asked a question. Did he answer it? Well, he did with another question. It's a red herring question. Is that what they call it? Where There's no good answer to the question. It's just a trap. And so Jesus doesn't choose option A or option B. He tells them the truth. Are any of you worthy? Why are you asking? Are you the judge? 
Are you perfect? And one by one, so some have thought about this. Why, why the older ones? And, and some have speculated. I, I mean, I don't know why. It doesn't say why. But I would almost assume that as we get older, we get a little more humble. Don't we? Ideally. <laughs> I know you all know 60-year-old kids that are running around, right? <laughs> we don't, growing older is not optional. Growing mature is optional, right? By and large, I wonder. I think Jesus gave them the chance to think about it. He stooped in the ground again. He continued writing whatever he was writing in the dirt. And one by one, they left. And, and isn't it like that? Each one of us must decide for themselves what we will do with Jesus. Every one of us must decide what choice will I make about this truth of Christ that he brings? He actually confronted the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Can't you see it? I love that Jesus did that. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? And by the way, when it says woman, where are they? You think, man, that's rude. <laughs> In English, that doesn't sound very good. But that's the same term that Jesus used of Mary Magdalene when she found him risen at the tomb. Woman, why are you looking for the living among the dead? It's a term of endearment. It's, it's a term of respect, as a matter of fact, in that culture. Where are they? Has no one condemned you? And here it is. Neither do I condemn you. Isn't that hopeful? Aren't you glad that Jesus' purpose is not to come and condemn us? Think about it. This is a person who is caught right in the middle of their sin. What would Jesus do if he could catch you right in the middle of your sin? I think he would give you the chance to repent. I think he would give you the chance to walk away from your sin quietly if you were willing. It's not his desire to condemn. How do I know that? Well, it's because he carried a cross and he absorbed all of the condemnation that we deserve because of our sin. And he invites us into a relationship with him a relationship of forgiveness, a relationship of good relationships, of, of wholeness, of restoration. That's why he's there. He didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world through him. Romans describes this in some legal terms. There's now no condemnation, a, a, a court term, the pronouncement of being guilty for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. They're, the Pharisees and teachers of the law, they're interested in the law of sin and death, not Jesus. For what the law was powerless to do, I mean, really, can anybody throw the first stone in here? What the law was powerless to do, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. That is the hope that Advent brings us and reminds us all about. Not a hope that we're going to be sinless. Not a hope that we're perfect. Not a hope that we're good enough or that we deserve it. But a hope that we have a God who does not condemn us by choice. It's our choice. What will we choose? I'm leaning toward the third point, right? Hope replaces shame with respect. Hope replaces condemnation with the cross. Jesus takes it for us. And hope replaces accusation with confrontation. Con means together. 
to be confronted is someone together with you revealing something. Not ignoring your sin. Not pretending it's none of my business because that's the world's approach, isn't it? Jesus' approach is to be with us. Isn't it remarkable that as soon as the crowd disperses, Jesus doesn't just walk away? He could, right? I mean, that's what was going on here. We understand that it was a public confrontation. It was a trap. That's what was happening. But Jesus not only sends the Pharisees away with something to think about, then he talks to this woman. Neither do I condemn you, declared Jesus, and that he added this phrase, go now and leave your life of sin. She too is unworthy of picking up a stone and throwing it at the crowd. Does that make sense? Hers was brought out more publicly and in a way that was so in such disregard of her dignity and respect. But there's an old saying that the ground is level at the cross. And none of us deserve salvation any more than the next person. Would you agree with that? I mean, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm outraged at the sin in the world and, and the pain and the disappointment. I, I am a J. I think I know how to fix it. Just ask me. Nobody asks me. But like you, I bow the knee before Jesus, who is the rightful judge, who chose to take on his own shoulders the burden of my sin and the sin of others that I would have the tendency to point my finger at. And what is his desire? What is his business with me or with them? It's the same. He's not desiring that any of us would perish. His will is that we would repent that we would turn from our life of sin. This is an example of Jesus confronting. Do you see it? He confronts the Pharisees, teachers of the law, for their sin, and he confronts this woman who has been dragged into his presence with her sin. Advent is a time, traditionally, of repentance. You know, in, in our culture, We take Christmas trees and lights and we decorate about now. Or if you're like some of your neighbors around Halloween, you've been seeing these Christmas lights going up everywhere. Our guide on our last Israel trip is a Messianic Jewish believer. And that means that he lives in a Jewish culture, he was raised in a Jewish family, and he believes that Jesus is the Messiah that the Jewish faith is anticipating. And so in Israel, they they don't have the trees and the lights and everything else. And he says, why do you American Christians have all that? You you almost associate it with your faith. (laughs) And and he's right. (laughs) This is a different culture. We have cultural trappings. And one of the problems with our festive decoration in the month of December is that actually as a religious observance, Advent has traditionally been a time not for celebration. Did you know that? Advent is a time for repentance. Advent, like Lent before Easter, is a period of time for us to humble ourselves before God and to repent, to to identify what sins are going to prevent us from recognizing the hope of Jesus or the peace that he offers or the joy or his love. What, what, What is going to stand in the way? It's our sin. I want to observe some time of open worship a time of quieting our hearts in humility before God. Christmas is coming. We can celebrate the resurrection of Christ, the birth of Christ. We can can celebrate everything that Christmas means. It's coming. But I think it's good for God's people to also observe those times of repentance, of saying, Lord, what are you speaking to me about in my heart? not the person that I want to 
drag up to the altar. <laughs> but my heart, what are you saying in me? What needs to change in me? Holy Spirit, would you search my heart and, and show me any way that's offensive to you that I may repent? And as we do that, I want you to know what's at stake. We are given this charge to be the light of the world. Jesus passed it on to his church, and there are people all around us who need Christ-like, light, hopeful, not condemning people in their lives. Do you get it? We are called to be that. And we're not ready if we cherish sin in our hearts. Open worship is a time of allowing the Spirit to speak to us in ways that we didn't necessarily plan. Could be a time where we spend in silence, where God speaks to us personally and individually, or if He prompts any of you to share because you know that, or suspect, or in obedience believe that speaking is, God's given you something for all of us, then please be obedient to do it. We actually mute the online portion of this service. We encourage those who are online, if God is speaking to you, to comment. We would love to hear how God is speaking to you. If you're in the fellowship hall and you have something to say, you're welcome to come in here and use this microphone because we so want to hear what the Spirit would have to say to us today. Let's listen and let's wait in God's presence together.